it's a real pleasure to bring this story here because in a way that's where it began. Years and years ago, I had first started working with Hiroko Fujita, a traditional Japanese storyteller. The very first time that I brought her to the United States to work with me, she landed in Dallas Fort Worth Airport, and I brought her to Texas Women's University, where Karen Morgan kindly let us experiment with her library science students to try out our bilingual style of storytelling because she would tell in Japanese and I would interpret. That evening, it was the Texas Storytelling Festival. So I brought her here on Thursday night and we listened to many, many ghost stories. And thanks to Joel Hill, she was able to understand pretty well her English better than my Japanese. But thanks to Joel's interpretation, she could follow in spite of the accents. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we went back to the motel, I said, well, how did you like it? And she said, Franza, very strange. American people tell ghost stories, everybody laughs. In Japan, when we tell ghost stories, nobody laughs. I said, oh, would you tell me one? And she did. And I'm going to tell it to you. Long time ago, in old Japan, there was a young woman who was the only child of the headman of the village. So when she came of age to marry, her parents put great effort in finding her just the right husband. At last, in another village, they found a young man who was strong and healthy and smart and good looking. And the marriage was arranged. Arranged marriages in those days. Sometimes they turned into love matches. Sometimes a man and woman just learned how to tolerate each other. She saw him for the first time when the ceremony was over. And they went home with everyone's wishes that they would live together many happy years. But she couldn't get used to him. Yes, he was healthy and strong and smart, but he was cold. And the longer they were together, the more she felt uncomfortable around him, until even the sound of his slippers flapping on the floor as he walked made her nerves crawl. The sound of his mouth when he ate turned her stomach. She couldn't stand it. And she knew if she went to her parents and asked for a divorce, how could she possibly complain of such a good man? Such a good husband. He was very good to her parents. The rest of the village thought he was a fine man. But she thought she would go mad if she had to live with him the rest of her life. And in desperation, she remembered some of the other village women had told her that there was a Bahasama, an old woman who lived out in the mountains and could help a woman who was troubled. So she went over a mountain and over a mountain and over a mountain to the mountain where Bahasama lived. She went up to that old house and the door stood open. She looked inside and there was the old woman busy weaving at a loom. The young bride waited at the door. Um, excuse me? Basama looked up. Are you sure that's what you want? Yes, said the young woman. Then you must follow my directions carefully from here. You must walk to the west until you come to a white mulberry tree full of silk caterpillars. Mark its location carefully. Then go home and count the days. And when the moon is round and full, come back and gather the cocoons of those 
those caterpillars. Take them home, count the days. And when the moon again is round and full, reel the silk off of those cocoons. And then, when the moon is again round and full, spin the silk into thread. And then, when the moon is again round and full, weave the thread into cloth. And then, when the moon is again round and full, bleach that cloth in the light of the moon. And then, when again the moon is round and full, cut and sew that cloth into a kimono for your husband. And then, when the moon is once more round and full, dress him in that kimono and you will see a long task. But she walked to the west and she found that tree, its leaves crawling with the caterpillars of the silk cloth. When the moon was round and full, she came back and gathered those cocoons. Again at the next moon, she reeled off the silk at the next full moon, she spun it into thread. At the next full moon, she wove it. At the next full moon, she bleached it in the light of the full moon. Then again, she sewed it. And finally, she said, husband, I have made you a kimono, a silk kimono. I have made it with my own hands for you. And he was pleased that she had done all this work and woven such beautiful silk. She put it on to him, and he was pleased even though it was white, which is the color of burial garments. <laughs> she dressed him gently in that kimono, and he was pleased, although she wrapped the fronts with right over left not left over right, as living people dress, but right over left, as you dress a corpse. She tied the OB sash around his hips, and he looked good. But his face went slack, and his eyes grew dull. And he walked out the door. And he didn't come back. She waited for him the next day. She waited many days. She had the house to herself. It was quiet. No sound of slippers on the floor. No sound of munching and sucking at food. But she began to wonder and worry what had become of him. At last she had to know, and so she went over a mountain and over a mountain and over a mountain to Ba Sama's house. And there she found Ba Sama again leaning at her loom. Waited in the door. Suddenly Ba Sama looked up and said, Well, do you want to know? The young woman said, Yes, please. Count the days, and when the moon is again round and full, go to the six-way crossroad outside of town. Wait for the moon to rise, and you will see. So on the right time, just before moonrise, she went out to the six-way crossroad by the cemetery. And as the moon rose, over the mountain, silhouetted against its silver face, she saw the form of a man coming toward her. Coming, he was not walking. There was no sway or stride. He was gliding toward her. As he got closer, she recognized it was her husband, but he did not look. Blank of face, dull of eye, he glided 
and went past her, and as he went by, he said, when first I put on clothes bleached in the moonlight, I did not know I would go to serve the god of death. That's the story of clothes bleached in the moonlight. And you did not laugh.